Welcome to the Sharkpreneur Podcast with Kevin Harrington and Seth Green. Kevin Harrington is the inventor of the infomercial, one of the original sharks from the hit TV show Shark Tank, and has generated over $5 billion in TV and digital direct response sales. Seth Green is the world's first trusted authority on cutting edge direct response marketing, a best selling author, and the only three time Marketer of the Year nominee. On the podcast, Kevin and Seth interview sharkpreneurs who share straight talk on what it takes to explode your business. Why do so many businesses struggle while others seem to explode overnight? Do you wish you had the secret to this type of exponential growth? Now, I've scaled more than 20 businesses to over $100 million, and it's not just luck. In my new book with Mark Tim, Mentor to Millions, you'll learn the repeatable framework I use in all my business ventures for massive success. Order at KevinMentor.com and get over $1,000 in bonuses. Head to KevinMentor.com. Welcome to the podcast, the show business edition. This is your host, Seth Green. Today, I have the good fortune to be interviewing Peter Heller, uh, producer and manager who has been at Heller Highwater Productions and has a lengthy career in the industry. Peter, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Let's go back in time a little bit. How'd you get started in the business? Um, I had the rare great professor at college who, when I told him I wanted to get a PhD, he said, don't do that. You're not the kind of guy who's going to write uh, you know, a 200 page thesis on two lines of Chaucer. And he actually told me about a career called a literary agent, which I had never heard of. And uh, this was a million years ago before the internet. And so I, I, I moved to New York, I was working as a bus boy. And I got a book called The Literary Marketplace out of the library. And it had uh, a list of over 100 literary agents in it. And I wrote them all a snail mail letter and I got a bunch of interviews and I got a job. And that really was the beginning. I worked for a literary agent in New York who uh, actually mostly represented playwrights. And so I, I had a, a kind of several year career in the theater. And someone once said, uh, you, can, you can't make a living in the theater. You can only make a killing. And uh, that turned out to be true. So um, I left, I got an MBA. And I used the MBA to come out to Hollywood and get into the movie business. And then you've had quite a, a long career in the movie business. Can you talk a little bit about kind of that journey? Yeah, so the MBA opened a door for me in the financial side and the kind of administrative side of, of the uh, entertainment industry. And I ended up starting at Universal Pictures working in uh, what in the studio system is called business affairs, which are the people who oversee all the contract negotiations and the financial stuff within the studios. Um, and so, but I use that really to kind of move over to the creative side as quickly as I could. I, I, I did some fun stuff when I was on the business affairs side. I was actually involved um, with Imagine Entertainment, which went public for a little while. And I, I, I helped uh, that deal go public. And I, I also was involved with the twins deal um, which worked out great for Universal, but created a, a precedent that turned out really badly for many of the other studios. Uh, it was the first movie um, ever where uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Danny DeVito, and Ivan Reitman um, all gave up their enormous salaries for a significantly better definition of a back end and profits on the movie because it was Arnold Schwarzenegger's first comedy. And there was a lot of, of worry that like he may not be able to really cross over from an action star to a comedy star. And so that deal ended up working out really well for Universal Pictures and for those three guys who made a fortune. But afterwards, the agencies used that deal and started getting deals where the, where the big actors like Arnold and the big directors like Ivan Reitman would get their upfront fees and the kind of definition and back end that those guys got. Um, and so, yeah, that didn't work out as well for a lot of the studios. Um, but so that was the fun part of the business side. And then I went over and became just a, a kind of more traditional creative executive development executive at Universal Pictures. Talk a little bit about, for our folks 
um, who might not necessarily know, what does a traditional creative executive do? Yeah, so the 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 <clears throat> the thing that's happened at the studios is they've added a lot of layers in terms of who gets to um, develop the screenplays before they become movies. It, it really used to be that the studios were, were pretty lean and there were just a few production executives and they would work directly with the writers and, and they, they made most of the stuff that they bought, you know, um, but starting in the 70s and really exploding in the 80s and 90s, the studios just started buying and optioning a lot of scripts and a lot of novels and a lot of comic books and a lot of other things that they were just like putting into development. And so they started adding all these layers of people who would have to hire writers and work with them to try to turn all these either <clears throat> intellectual property or the existing screenplays into better scripts that could get made. And so that when you're in your early jobs, a lot of your work is on the lesser projects. The studio's not so sure they're going to get made, but you know, they've optioned a script or they've bought a comic book and they want you to hire a writer and figure out how to turn it into a movie. And so, you know, you start the lowest level job is usually called creative executive. And then they create all sorts of layers, you know, uh, director of development, manager of development, vice president of development. And you just keep moving up and up and up um, until you finally get to actually get some movies made and oversee the production of those movies. That's got to be incredibly gratifying. When you actually get one of the movies to go into production, it's incredibly gratifying. Yeah. And that's really the, the, the boost to your career. What caused, what inspired you to start Heller Highwater? So I uh, really wanted to be a studio executive. Um, I wanted to stay at Universal Pictures. Uh, I got the blessing and the curse of getting sort of an enormous promotion and an incredible opportunity at a time when I wasn't really yet as experienced as I needed to be. What happened was um, Universal Pictures had made an overall deal with John Hughes and he moved onto the lot. Um, I was involved with moving him onto the lot. I got to know him, he liked me. And the president of his company had left and, and he talked to the powers that were at Universal and said, why doesn't Peter come over and run my company? And it was it was an amazing opportunity. John Hughes was a genius uh, working for him. In the one year that I worked for him, he produced Home Alone, Career Opportunities. Uh, he wrote the scripts for Beethoven, Dutch, Curly Sue. He sold his only TV show. I mean, the guy was so prolific and so funny. But <clears throat> he was definitely the kind of person who had like an on-off switch with the people who worked for him. And so he loved me for a year and then he fired me. And um, to this day, I don't know why he fired me. He just did. That's what John did. Even after he had really one of the great years of his career, because it was the home alone year. Um, and so I, I wanted to go back into the studio system and couldn't get a job within the studio system. So I became what's very similar to a studio executive, but it's called a production executive where you do kind of the same thing, developing scripts, hoping they go into production, overseeing the production, but you're doing it now for a production company. And I did that for a couple of production companies. And the, the last company that I did it for was a company called uh, Propaganda Films. And at the time in the nineties, they were the premier music video and commercial production company in town. Their partners included David Fincher, who's just one of the great directors. And, uh, uh, and they had on their roster a whole list of other terrific directors. And so it was really a great experience. Uh, I got to work on a lot of really cool films. And then uh, Propaganda got sold and the company actually ended up going away. And I realized there really wasn't a company that I wanted to work for anymore. You know, like propaganda was the greatest and it was sort of over. And I just decided I'm going to start my own company. Well, congratulations on doing that. Obviously, you've been successful. You've been doing that a long time. How with how do you source talent? How do you find talent? So I I have had two versions of my company with a 
uh, what I like to call my sojourn in academia because I needed to get two kids through private colleges and and it was very difficult to do on the very up and down salary of an independent producer manager. So the first version of my company, I sourced talent by going to a lot of the screenwriters that I had worked with within the studio system and then at the production companies I worked with and saying, listen, I know a lot about the studio system. I've been a buyer. I understand the people you're selling to. Let me help you sell your projects. And it was a pretty good pitch. And so at that point, I was focused more on mid to late career writers who had sort of fallen off the lists. Like all the studios and production companies have lists of the writers they want to be in business with. And what happens when you become a mid-career or later career writer is very often you've moved out of town. You know, you don't want to raise your kids in L.A. or it's just too expensive or you'd really just rather live somewhere else. So you're not taking the same meetings. You're not meeting the same people. You're not. And you fall off the lists of people they want to be in business with. So my my pitch to these mid-level and, and late career writers was I can get you back in touch with all these people and get you working again. So that was the first version of my company. I worked with a lot of kind of experienced produced screenwriters, helping them get back in touch with people and get stuff made, you know, set up again. Then I went to work at Loyola Marymount University and um, left there and went to UCLA. And I did really the fundraising for the film schools and the industry relations for the film schools, which led me to have a lot of relationships with new young people who were graduating from these programs. And also it put me in touch with a lot of other screenwriting professors around the country as I did various academic conferences and stuff in the film school world. And so in my new version of Hell or High Water, I continue to represent some mid-career and late-career writers, but I've been much more focused on launching careers of new writers who aren't necessarily young, but, you know, new writers. And uh, I really enjoy that, the the, the launching of the careers. What, <laughs> uh, how has, there are so many more channels for content now. And I don't mean channels of like, let's say television, but I mean like Netflix and Amazon and YouTube are all becoming studios in their own rights. How does that affect your business? Yeah, so that it, it, it's definitely affected my business. It, 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 at first, it was a real blessing. Um, there really was, you know, that second golden age of television. And there is also the original pilot was actually a relatively new thing. Um, it used to be that to, to work in the TV industry, you would write episodes of existing shows and you would say, hey, look, I can, you know, I can write in the voice of Steve Bochco. I can write in the voice of, you know, all these great TV creators and you get hired onto those shows. Um, the Shield and then uh, Desperate Housewives were the first two shows that actually sold on original scripts, original pilots. Those guys felt like I don't want to write in somebody else's voice anymore. I want to just create my own show. And so really, when I relaunched my business, that was what I was focused on, was getting these original pilots out there and saying, look, here are these new young writers with great voices, make their TV shows, you know. Um, but that golden age of television has kind of come to an end. And even the streaming services that you were talking about now, really, they want they they want to be in business with experienced showrunners. Um, they have the money to do it. They have the clout to do it. You know, they're not new anymore. And the and the people who who were experienced, who really had, just a few years ago would thought they would rather just be working with the traditional networks. They all now want to work with the streaming services. And so, um, it, it's gotten a, a lot harder to make those original pilots work at all these companies. Um, so that's one thing that's changed. And the, the, the other thing that's really changed with the streaming services is that the pandemic, I think, hastened uh, something that was going to happen anyway, which was the collapse of people going to theaters to see movies. Um, you know, with with everybody owning a big screen TV and being able to watch a lot of content in their house, they don't want to go to the theaters unless it's a movie they absolutely have to see on a big screen or it's date night or family day and you just want to get out of the house and, you know, go to a movie. And so the streaming services are going through a real sea change on what kinds of movies they want to make and how much they want to spend on them and which of those movies are going to go into theaters 
and which of those movies are just going to be things that people watch at home. So the business is in a lot of turmoil right now. Well, which makes it an interesting time. You, may, you alluded to earlier the income fluctuation of an independent producer, because I'm guessing you don't get, you know, the writers aren't paid. The writers are paid. You're getting commission, a percentage. So a movie has got to get sold. So in essence, you've got to wait for that to happen to get paid. So as a business owner, how do you manage that in terms of cash flow? It's difficult. And, and um, it's why as a sole practitioner manager, the, the, the way you survive is by just keeping your nut really low, right? So I work out of the house. I don't have an assistant. You know, it's it, my nut is really low. And that's why, like I said, I had to take that sojourn in academia because my nut was not low when you have two kids in private colleges. <laughs> um, so that's when I, you know, needed a salary and benefits and worked at the universities. Um and then actually the, 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 the balance that you see a lot, and this is even true at the big management companies, is the commissions are your bread and butter, that, you know, but you're only earning 10% of someone else's income. The, the big paydays are when you earn your producing fees. And so management companies, unlike agencies, are allowed to be producers. And so that what the management companies are looking for is, yes, we have a steadier cash flow from our commissioning of our clients, but our big payday is when a movie actually goes and we're a producer on it. And then instead of earning 10% of hundreds of thousands of dollars and earning a, a, you know, a five-digit income, you get that six-digit income as the producing fee. You've had such a long career What's your biggest challenge now? Um, the biggest challenge is not being jaded and cynical and and just fed up with a business that is so difficult and irrational. Um, you know, there is no career path in this business. It's it's very much a fear based economy, um, you know, and, 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 if, and when you've been in it as long as I have, you've heard all the same things over and over and over from that fear-based economy. And, and yet, you know, or I know that I have good taste and that I have really good projects and, and these projects get made, you know, and it's like, um, just buy these things. They're great. <laughs> you know, and, and then you get to the point where it's like, I, I don't want to keep banging my head against the wall because it feels so good when I stop. Um, so yeah, you just have to protect against getting jaded and just continue to believe in the the talent will out, you know, and eventually people will recognize, oh, that is a really good writer. We need to hire him or her. Your passion is obvious. What do you like best about what you're doing? I, I mean, over all the years, um, you do, you know, there's so, the role of a producer, the role of a representative can be so varied um, what, what I've discovered is the part I, I love the most is working with talented writers on making sure that the idea that they have and the movie or TV show that they're envisioning becomes the best possible version of that idea, of that movie, of that TV show, and sprinkling in just enough of what the marketplace expects. I'm not marketplace driven because there is no such thing as a commercial film. Like if you try to pitch everything everywhere all at once, that is not a commercial film. It's almost, you know, impossible to pitch. And yet it's probably on a return on investment basis, one of the most successful films of last year. And it's certainly going to win a lump, you know, bunch of Oscars and everybody loves it. Right. So you, if you went into that with the Daniels and said, this film is not commercial because the marketplace wants this, that, or the other thing, you would never end up with such a great film. But if you don't counsel your writers a little bit about the marketplace, they'll develop a great script that absolutely can't get sold just because of market considerations. So that's the balancing act. And I love working with writers toward that balance. Can you give me a, a great script that can't get sold. Can you give me an example of why you couldn't, why a great script couldn't get sold? Yeah. Um, 
the, one of the things that you hear all the time, like I, I do sometimes still enjoy going to like a pitch fest and, and having people who are outside the business, you know, get that opportunity to actually bring their stuff to people who are inside the business like me. And one of the things they'll often say is, you've never read anything like this, right? That's always a telltale sign that this is going to be an unsellable project. Because honestly, if something completely defies genre, if something completely defies what we've already seen in the marketplace, there's a reason for that. There's no market for it, you know? And so it might be actually really brilliant and original and fresh, but that will not work as a movie or a TV show, you know? Uh, it, it's just, it's show business. It's not show art. And at a certain point, things get, too out there, too artistic, too offbeat to actually be made. Show business, not show art. That's a writer downer. I like that one a lot. We know your time is incredibly valuable. We greatly appreciate you spending some of it with us. Where can our folks go if they wanted to learn more about you? Um, that's an interesting. I don't like. I I am on. Uh, you know the 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 uh, industry. Um service imdb and imdb pro uh, i think my bio's up there um but as a sole practitioner i actually kind of i'm i'm social media wary because i do all my own reading i don't have an assistant and you so three thousand scripts tomorrow is what exactly you're it's a little it's a little overwhelming if you know too many people find me and get in contact with me is there a particular genre you lean towards or specialize in or like working on more no, I'm really, I'm really eclectic in my tastes. Even when I was a producer, I've, you know, I produced a family film. I produced a horror movie. I produced a coming of age drama. Uh, you know, I, what I'm really looking for is a voice. It, 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 I think the, 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 this is true of all my clients and even the movies I produced. I'm, I'm looking for something that has something fresh and something to say within a genre that people understand. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And again, we greatly appreciate your time. This has been Seth Green with Peter Heller of Heller Highwater. Peter, thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thanks for having me on your show. Thanks everybody for watching or listening. We'll talk to you or see you next time. Take care. Do you need money to fund your idea, product, or service? Are you ready to take your business to the next level but need capital to get it done? Kevin Harrington has heard more than 50,000 pitches and knows how to help you make the perfect pitch to get the funding for your entrepreneurial dream. He's distilled the process down in his perfect pitch cheat sheet, and it's yours for free. Just text PITCH to him right now at 727-888-2100. Text PITCH to 727-888-2100 right now and claim your free perfect pitch cheat sheet. Text PITCH to 727-888-2100 to start funding your dream today. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer.